Our first Bible re reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 12, and these words will serve as a basis of this morning's sermon. We hear, The Lord appeared to Solomon and Gideon in a dream at night. God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon said, You've shown great mercy and faithfulness to your servant, my father David, just as he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness of heart toward you. You have shown this great mercy and faithfulness to him, and have given him a son who is seated on his throne to this very day. O Lord my God, now you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And I, your servant, am among your people whom you have chosen, a great people who cannot be counted or numbered because they are so many. Now give to your servant a perceptive heart to judge your people, to distinguish between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? In the eyes of the Lord, Solomon's request was good. So God said to him, Because you have asked for this, and you have not asked for a long life, nor have you asked for riches, nor have you asked for the lives of your enemies, but you have asked for discernment to reach just verdicts. Therefore I will act according to your words. Yes, I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you before you, nor will anyone like you rise up after you. This is the word of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on this morning was the first Bible reading we heard from 1 Kings chapter 3. So as we uh, begin meditation on that Word, let's pray. Lord, we know that we can come to you always in prayer. And so as we sit here, as we meditate on your Word, as we take it in, speak to us, open our ears, open our hearts, grant us wise, perceptive, discerning hearts that we would seek to serve others with all the gifts you give us. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe it's because it's a, it's a generational thing, but I remember when the movie Aladdin came out, and uh, soon afterwards you start thinking to yourself, if I had just three wishes, Three things that I got out of rubbing some kind of magical lamp and a genie popped out. What is it that I would wish for? I mean, these wishes, you have to be very careful with what you wish for. You don't want to, you know, just speak something very broad, very general, something that can be twisted and distorted so it won't actually be what you're wishing it to be. But you have to think these wishes out very well, very succinctly, and I know that's what I used to do used to have those conversations with my friends, think about them, what would be the perfect wishes? Now as far as where the origins of, of magic genies and lamps and all that comes from, I don't really have an answer for you on that. But humans have always desired wish fulfillment. That's nothing new. Maybe one of the reasons why we sit here and think about what would be my wish fulfillment is because of this story. Because God came to Solomon one night. He came to him when he was at this place called Gibeon, worshiping the Lord. And that night when God came to Solomon in a dream, he said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Total blank check. Whatever you want, your wildest dreams, the thing you desire, I am going to give that to you. That's pretty awesome. You might wonder, what did Solomon do that made him so worthy of such a great blank check sort of promise to fulfill all his wishes? Maybe it's just because Solomon was such a good, devout believer. I mean, he was there worshiping at Gibeon. Maybe it's because his father David was such a good, devout believer. The only one in the Bible who says uh, he was a man after the Lord's own heart. So why did the Lord come to Solomon and give him this blank check promise fulfillment, this wish fulfillment? Well, really, when we start to dive into Solomon, start to dive into his background, you're not exactly going to find the most pristine person in the Bible. 
You think about first where he came from. He is the son of David and Bathsheba. Now David married Bathsheba because David had an affair with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and then when he couldn't hide it, he arranged the murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, made it look like he was just a casualty of war. Then he married Bathsheba. Not exactly coming from great and wonderful, pious, holy beginnings. And then chapter 3 of 1 Kings, when we're bringing into Solomon as he's just starting out his reign as king, one of the first things we hear about is that he went to Egypt and he married the daughter of the Pharaoh. He married the princess of Egypt. And yet, God had told specifically his people, don't marry other people for the sake of political alliances, which is exactly what Solomon just did. And then just a verse or two later, we're told Solomon goes to worship the Lord on this high place at Gibeon because it was the most important high place. But high places, that's not what the Lord told the Israelites to do when it was to worship him. In fact, he had built that during the time of Moses some 400 years earlier of here's this tent, the tabernacle. This is the house of worship. My ark and the covenant will be here. I will reside over the ark. This is where you offer the sacrifices I prescribe to you. This is how you come to the Lord, how I tell you to, not following the practices of the Canaanite people. And yet that's exactly what a high place was. It was a remnant. It was a leftover of pagan worship that the Israelites brought into their lives. Solomon's not some pristine, great, wonderful, devout believer. In fact, later in life, we're told that his many wives that he took on actually led him away from the faith. So God does not owe Solomon anything. And it's not because Solomon was so righteous that the Lord comes to him and offers them this, this blank check of wish fulfillment. So why does the Lord come to Solomon? Why does the Lord come and give him such a great and wonderful offer? Really, Solomon gets it. It's in his own words. He says in response to the Lord, he says, You have shown great mercy and faithfulness to your father, to, my, to your servant, my father David, just as he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness of heart towards you. You have shown this great mercy and faithfulness to him and have given him a son who is seated on his throne to this very day. Solomon doesn't say, well, God, I've been expecting you. I've been waiting for you because you owe this to me. And he didn't say, well, God, I kind of figured this would happen because, you know, my father David had done such great things in your name. But Solomon simply says, no, it's because of your mercy. You treat me not as I deserve to be treated and your faithfulness, that you always make good on your word, and actually often in spite of what I do. God, you're the initiator. You're the one who has this mercy and this love for me, even though it's completely undeserved. That's why you're coming to me. You have done this. This is what you want to do. So the Lord comes to Solomon and offers him this blank check promise of wish fulfillment. But do you know that you have the exact same promise? Now the Lord didn't appear to you in a vision or in a dream and, and say this to you like he did Solomon. But Jesus himself says, Amen, amen, I tell you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made complete. Or as Jesus would say, as we're asking, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. God himself has spoken to you and has said, just ask for whatever you want. And I'll give it to you. Jesus, God, he offers the same blank check, promise fulfillment as he did to Solomon. And it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we're so good and so pious and because we're so much better than the other people in this world. But it is because of his great mercy his great faithfulness, that he comes to us and he gives us this blank check promise. So what are you going to do with it? Jesus has come to you with this big wish fulfillment of a promise. What are you going to do with it? 
We heard what Solomon did, that in response to the Lord coming to him in this dream at night, he says, Give to your servant a perceptive heart to judge your people, to distinguish between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? So not riches, not power, not death of his enemies, not even superpowers. I mean, come on, Solomon, you, you, you get a little bit more imaginative with your, your request. But he asked for a perceptive heart. I don't know about you, but when I went back and I was thinking about the Aladdin story, I was thinking, what would be my three perfect wishes? That was probably not in my top three. In fact, I don't even know how good of a story Aladdin would have been had his first wish to the genie been, well, give me a wise and perceptive heart. You know, could we really blame Solomon if he would have asked for one of those other things? How many times have we sat back and we just kind of have wished to have a little bit more wealth, to make things a little bit easier, to be able to do the things that we aren't able to do otherwise, to know that we don't have any worries or concerns, nothing about unexpected problems or emergency funds, but just be able to just spend this wealth however we wanted to, whatever we wanted to. Well, if we're really getting serious about this kind of wish fulfillment idea, I think the kind of no-brainer everybody goes to first is if you're going to give me one wish, well, I'm going to wish for so many more wishes so I can just keep on wishing, 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 and getting more things. A lot of people would ask for riches. A lot of people would ask for the death of their enemies. A lot of people would ask for a long life. The more I thought about this, this is, this is real, this is me as a kid, and I thought long and hard, if you give me enough time, I'll come up with a really good wish, I'll come up with something that's foolproof, I'll come up with something just as good as Solomon's, that's what I like to believe about myself. Even though it's not my first instinct, my first instinct is to ask for something that just benefits me. Because I'm selfish. Give me more time, I'll come up with something better. And so I came up with that answer. And I thought to myself, you know what I would wish for? I would wish for that all sin in the world would be taken away. And then it took me another couple seconds to realize, wait a minute, that one already got fulfilled. Because that was the descendant of Solomon, of David the king who would come to rule all nations, the king promised long ago, the one that the Lord stuck to his word, that he was truly faithful with. Here comes the descendant of David, of Solomon, born of Mary and Joseph, of a very humble beginning. But this is God made flesh, living for us, born under the law to redeem those under the law, to buy us from out under the law, to pay for all the sins, all the times that we have been selfish, that we've thought really only of ourselves, and we've thought we have the wise and discerning heart already. We don't need to pray for the wisdom, for a perceptive heart. We're already smart. We're already intelligent. Just give me more of the things I want to make my life easier. It was for those sins that Jesus died for. It was the fact that that we gravitate towards our own needs first. That he came to live for others, to live for us, to live perfectly under that law. Because this is what he said he would do. So in his great mercy, in his faithfulness, the Lord came as the descendant of Solomon, of David, and he took away the sins of the world. That wish is already granted free and available for every single person of all time. And the day will come when all sin is removed from this world, where there will be no more effects of sin, we'll no, no longer experience pain or suffering or mourning or death, and we aren't going to be thinking about how can I make more money, how can I get more vacation time, how can I live longer, because we will live forever with the Lord. 
See, when it comes to God, we don't need to think through these kind of wish fulfillments in that way. We don't need to think through, well, how is it that I need to formulate my prayer so that it gets just right, so that I, I don't pray it wrong, so that it can be manipulated or distorted, because we know our God wants to give us good gifts. That in fact, he richly supplies us with all things for our enjoyment. He truly does look out for us, watch out for us, and grant us our purpose just to give us happiness in life. And I know I don't need to ask for more wishes because there is no limit to what I can ask the Lord for. This is the treasure of prayer. Just as Jesus talked about the one who knows what the kingdom of heaven is, who knows what God is, who seeks God, it's like someone who brings out of his treasure, out of his storehouses, old treasures as well as new ones. We have this old treasure of prayer. And maybe today we use it in a little bit different way, a little bit in a new way. Solomon asked for a wise and discerning heart, for a perceptive heart. He asked for the ability to help others. Do we ask for that? Do we turn around to the God who says, I will give you whatever you ask and say to him, God, give me the gifts and the abilities to help others. So we can take an example from Solomon. And say, God, give me a perceptive heart. Help me to be wise and discerning. Help me to see the needs of others and to see the means by which I can help others those people, that wherever it comes in my life, wherever my vocation is, my calling, the place you have put me, whether it is as a spouse, as a child, as a student, as an employer, as an employee, wherever it is, Lord, give me that wise and perceptive heart. Use me to serve others, to see those needs, and to find the best way to serve them. That no matter what you think about the government, whether you think about it on the local level, on the national level, whether you think that they're doing a good job or the worst job ever, pray for perceptive hearts for them. Pray that the Lord would give them wisdom to serve, to do things that are right, to, to better our people, our nation, both locally and, and all abroad. Pray for perceptive hearts when it comes to your church leaders. That we too, we, we're not perfect, we're not better than Solomon, we too fall short, we sin. We need wise and perceptive hearts to serve you, to serve this community. So pray for your leaders. And know that whenever you do, because the Lord has given you that same blank check of a promise of wish fulfillment, ask for whatever you want and I will give it to you so you know when you pray these things, you pray them in the Lord's name, you pray to him confidently knowing he will hear and answer you because of his great mercy and faithfulness, well, you know he's going to answer you the way that he answered Solomon. He's going to say to you, because you've asked for this, I will act according to your words. Yes, I will give you a wise and discerning heart. So take this treasure, this old treasure of prayer that we've had for so long, and make it do to pray for wise and perceptive hearts for ourselves, for our government, for our leaders in our church, that our Lord would give them these things so that we can serve others as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen. Please do. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.